Okay, um, I'll get started. Uh, most of you know I'm Jun Li. I'm a faculty member in DCMB. Uh, today it's really my pleasure and my honor to introduce our good colleague and friend, Jen Ma. Jen is a associate professor in the computational biology department at uh, the Carnegie Mellon University, where he is also affiliated with the machine learning department. Jen received his PhD in computer science at Penn State, followed by postdoc training with David Hausler at UC Santa Cruz. He then joined the faculty at UIUC, the University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign. At both UIUC and CMU, he leads a highly productive computational genomics group, creating a fairly large body of impactful work. His work is in developing new algorithms to study, study the structure and function of the human genome and epigenome with a focus on nuclear organization and its role in gene regulation with uh, many exciting extensions to comparative genomics and single cell biology. Uh, Jen is well known and ISCB and RECON is on the advisory board of cell systems on the editorial board of genome biology and he's the deputy editor of uh, PLOS Computational Biology. Jen has received many awards. Uh, earlier, there was an NSF Career Award, and, and 10 days ago, he was awarded as a contact PI, uh, a UM1 center project for the NIH 4D nucleon program. This used to be extremely rare, but is increasingly appreciated for a computational folk, computation focused scientist to lead such major endeavors as the other three centers are led by Joe Decker, Bill, Whit, um, Bill Noble, and Bin Ren. Uh, the last thing I would like to point out is Jan received this year's Guggenheim Fellowship, which used to be uh, mainly for writers and creative artists and rare for natural sciences. Uh, one of his co-awardees in the same class is Jennifer Dotna, who is in today's <laughs> news cycle. For, be the latest Nobelist. So Jen actually sort of, believe me when I say this, he predicted her winning yesterday, half a day before the announcement. So well, what type of uh, multi-scale data integration he used, I hope one day I'll learn. So uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Jen, who, uh, who's, the title of his talk is Probing the Nuclear Organization via Machine Learning. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for the kind, very kind introduction. Um, it's great to uh, see some of you. I met you, some of you, uh, I think about five, over five years ago. So it's great to see you again. Um, so let me um, jump right in. So I will uh, give you an overview of some of our recent work in this arena to develop uh, computational methods to um, analyze uh, the high order genome organization um, in the context of uh, the cell nucleus. And um, so nu nuclear organization, um, it is, you know, our genome, three pairs of chromosomes and human genome, three pairs of chromosomes and about six feet long, two meters long, but they're packaged into, um, you know, five micrometer nucleus. And these kind of, um, um, packaging organization is actually highly regulated, but we still don't have very uh, deep understanding of, of, this, of this organization. And, and at the high level, so we all know that these uh, chromosomes are very much compartmentalized uh, in the nucleus, just like some of the other um, cellular um, um, uh, phenomena that you see in, in within within the cell, and um, they can be uh, largely divided into say A compartment and B compartment. And if you zoom in, you're going to see uh, finer resolution structures like um, chromatin, you know, topologically associated domains or chromatin loops. And these kind of structures are also strongly related to uh, genome function, for instance, transcription and also DNA replication. And um, our recent um, interest uh, really spans. Um, uh, many different topics that uh, all related to uh, this this organization. Um, so I will briefly touch upon, for instance, the spatial compartmentalization of the genome relative to major uh, nuclear bodies in the, in the nucleus, and um, also our recent work to uh, to mine sort of the, the patterns 
between chromatin and also other um, nuclear constituents like proteins and, and potentially even RNAs. Um, and we have a keen interest in uh, revealing the mechanisms, also the functions of these organizations in different cellular conditions. And Jun mentioned the uh, for the nucleon phase two, and that will be that will be a, a major focus uh, to 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 continue. And my lab has a long and uh, uh, lasting uh, interest in um, um, comparative genomics. So we are we have also developed a few uh, some of the first uh, comparative genomics approaches for comparing. Um, high order genome organization across mammalian species, but I won't uh, talk about that today. So just to get everybody uh, um, oriented on, on the same page. So uh, this is uh, one slide on uh, introduction of HI-C. Uh, it is a method to uh, detect a chromatin interaction in genome-wide manner. So uh, you know, first step involves the uh, cross-linking of the cells and followed by fragmentation. Um, of the chromatin by uh, digestion, for example, using restriction enzymes. And um, in high C, um, these, um, uh, the restriction you know, fragment ends will be labeled by uh, biotin, and these ligated products um, will be enriched uh, using, for instance, pull down. And um, uh, consequently, the genome-wide uh, uh, chromatin interaction can be interrogated uh, um, in a sort of all-by-all -all manner. And some earlier um, methods based on three C's, you know, one versus or, 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 uh, but this approach high C is all by all. And then from these kind of data, you can generate these uh, so-called contact maps where um, these these different intensities or different patterns will correspond to different three uh, D genome uh, features. Um, highest resolution as as loops, as you can see here, like correspond to a dot of diagonal dot that correspond to a loop. But you may also be able to see these. Uh, patterns along the diagonal of the contact map, like these topological associated domains uh, tabs, where a group of chrom chromatins are interacting with each other much more frequently than uh, than their uh, to, to the nearby loci. And in the in the in the very in the low resolution, the highest level, you'll be able to see these chromatin territories where these chromatins are also interacting with each other in in the nuclear space. More recently, there are also new developments because I, I want to give one, one slide introduction because I will touch upon these technologies for ligation free methods uh, for mapping the chromatin uh, interactions. And the advantage of these approaches is that they can capture the interactions that go beyond the distance of direct ligations in high C. And uh, they can also de delineate uh, multiple chromatin loci um, that. Uh, interactively that form these, these complex uh, interactions, multi-way interactions in the same nucleus. Because these high C if it's population level, when you see several loci uh, uh, show these, these uh, loops, it's hard to uh, tell whether it's a population average, whether they are actually happening in the same nucleus. So these uh, methods like Sprite uh, and, and another approach called Chia, Chia Drop can um, uh, have the potential to review these um, th this information. So in the sprite only, this is the approach is the goal is to capture complexes in, in nucleus and only DNA fragments that were um, sort of cross-linked together will have the same uh, bar uh, combinations of barcode. And by reading out these combinations of a barcode with the same barcode and these uh, uh, sequences that are involved, um, that will, you can read out uh, the chromatin loci that are involved in the same uh, complex as a multi-way interaction. In Chedrop, um, 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 the key is to use the microfluidics uh, device to uh, capture um, the complexes of, by, by droplet formation. So if the chromatins are, can be captured by this and they are, you can read out this single molecule. So in this, this type of data where each line is a, is, a, is a readout of a single molecule and there are multiple loci could be involved in a multi-way chromatin interaction. Now, um, when I first got into this um, nuclear organization field, I was uh, quite uh, amazed by the fact that uh, people seems to mm, really focus on mm, chromatin interactions, like loops that they have. And right now, you can actually map that into very high resolution. But when it comes to large scale uh, structures, the chromatin uh, compromisation or their spatial organization within the nucleus, uh, people would just say, oh, the chromatins can be divided into A and B. If you read uh, review articles, in, including some of the very recent review articles, um, that's pretty much the status quo. Um, understanding is that uh, 
large scale chromosomes segregated in space in compartment A and compartment B, where compartment A are mostly correspond to active chromatins and compartment, compartment B are mostly correspond to repressive chromatins. Um, uh, in, this is actually first discovered in, um, reviewed even in, in the first high C paper in, in uh, Lieberman et al. in the science paper where you can um, sort of by a, a simple um, um, eigenvalue analysis, you can you can tell where the chromosomes are segregated in, in A and B, where a A's are uh, open and, and, and op active chromatins and B's are, uh, are more repressive. And this has been widely used in high C type of analysis by looking at the large scale chromatin compromisations. Um, but um, in in uh, the in situ high C paper, also from uh, Arez's group, this Raudo cell paper about six six years ago, um, this is in GM12878. This very high coverage high C, about five billion base pair, perhaps still the highest coverage high C data so far. If you look at the high, if you use the very high coverage high C, and then um, you will be able to actually see finer resolution. Uh, compartmentalization patterns, what the authors call the subcompartments, by clustering the interchromosomal contact maps. So here's actually what they did. So you take these uh, interchromosomal contact matrix, matrix where the rows are coming from um, odd chromosomes and the columns are all even, even chromosome loci, and you immediately can see that there are some patterns um, that, that show up. So what they did is they can do a, um, a simple clustering. They actually used a Gaussian HMM to identify these patterns. So the color bars at the, at the, at the top and on and, and the side, these are or um, assigned subcompartments. And they identified five major subcompartments where A compartment can be largely divided into A2 and A1 and A2, and B compartment can be largely divided into B1, B2, and B3 uh, subcompartments. And um, the authors show that these subcompartments actually have very uh, distinct correlations with other functional genomic data. So this is very informative. Um, however, uh, one limitation, of course, is that such clustering needs very, very high coverage interchromosomal high C contact map, which typical high C data doesn't, doesn't really have. So um, a, a couple of years ago, so a, a new graduate student, Kyle in the group, so he had came up with this idea and perhaps we can do something to um, enhance the signals of a low or moderate coverage high C data in order to uh, also perform subcompartment annotations. And um, this idea is very simple. It's just like image analysis. You have a distorted image or, or, or uh, in very low resolution, like this is the MR90 low coverage high C data. This is interchromosome high C. You see that uh, a lot of missing entries. So our goal is to uh, potentially enhance the signals and you can impute the missing values. And if you enhance the signals, you can have this reconstructed interchromosome high C contact map such that you will be able to call subcompartments like these color bars you know, here in this track. These are the annotated subcompartments. And with that, you'll be able to uh, um, annotate a subcompartment in many different cell types such that you'll be able to see how conserved or, 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 or different these subcompartments are across different across different cell types because high C data actually they're quite uh, you know many cell types have high C data. Um, so this is what, 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 uh, what we did so we um, uh, uh, um, to achieve this we trained a, um, um, a denoising autoencoder and uh, using um, the high coverage high C data so you downsample uh, the tr to train that you downsample the input data and then I think I, on the next slide I have a diagram uh, how we actually did that and then you impute you can you, you can impute uh, the missing value in the contact map by uh, training this denoising autoencoder. And by utilizing the latent uh, variables, you, we can use that to predict the uh, different subcompartments. And eventually we actually apply this to uh, nine uh, different cell types. So for the first time, we'll be able to see how conserved these different subcompartments are across human cell types. So here's, here's the simple diagram. So this is the sparse um, high C uh, contact matrix. You can uh, by you can generate this by we generated this by downsampling the original um, high coverage of high C and this is the target um, uh, dense high C contact map to so train this uh, denoise auto autoencoder and uh, for the latent variables we use this highlighted the bluish uh, highlighted region these latent variable as the input for another uh, classifier and here we just use uh, MLP but you know other um, other um, classifiers can may, may also work. And as, as a result, you can see that this at the top here, this is our result by comparing to 
predictions in GM1 to A78 by comparing to various other uh, histone modifications or even you know, replication timing different fractions. Um, and you can see that this is in the original publication uh, in terms of the enrichment. And you see that patterns are almost identical, uh, showing that uh, the performance is, 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 is strong. And then we uh, apply this approach in other cell types um, so here I show you I show you two examples in KFOXS2 and MR90. Um, so we train the model in GM1 to A78, and then you apply this to other cell types, and you can use these um, uh, functional genomic data as a way to evaluate orthogonal data to evaluate uh, the, the predictions. So we can see that that these uh, state boundaries. This is uh, subcompartment A2, and this is subcompartment B1. In the original uh, B, uh, GM1 to A78, there is a uh, a stark transition for the active marks going from A2 to B1, and there is also a, a sharp transition of this repressive mark K3, K27 trimethyl, um, um, you know, the signal will increase. And you can see the exact same pattern in um, other cell types, uh, demonstrating that the approach can also be, uh, that the training model can also be translated to uh, other cell types by uh, predicting the subcompartment patterns in, 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 a, in a new cell type. So then we, um, um, apply this to uh, other cell types and uh, to, you know, listed here, these are all the cell types that we use this in, in the publication um, uh, to um, review what are, you know, to the, for, for these different types of, um, for these different types of um, um, annotations, um, how conserved they are and how cell type specific they are. And um, showing here in this uh, browser shot, you see that um, for this active regions, like this is A2 subcompartments, they're are quite conserved and for the repressive regions that uh, you see that they're, they're, they're both of them are relatively conserved, but they also see more dynamic regions like uh, this one in uh, the highlight in the, in the blue box here, where there's only one, looks like there's only one um, uh, cell type, HeLa cell that shows um, active um, uh, subcompartment A A2. Uh, so you can actually use other uh, function genomic data as a way to uh, assess how reliable the predictions um, are. And you can see that uh, if you look at the replication timing here, and only in HeLa, uh, the replication timing is early, indicating that uh, it's more likely that this chromatin is uh, towards the nuclear interior. You can see that uh, uh, the active mark is 3K27 acetylation, also more enriched in uh, HeLa cells. So, and, and we found that the most, most in, uh, conserved uh, subcompartments are mostly in A1 and B3, so those, those two anchors. Um, in, in the towards the uh, nuclear interior or towards the uh, periphery of the nucleus. So this is um, uh, good, uh, but um, the still limitation is very clear. Uh, uh, the high C subcompartments do not actually uh, explicitly tell us uh, compartmentation patterns to multiple uh, subnuclear structures. They uh, only uh, tell us these different. They are correlated. You know, A1, A2 are more towards nuclear interior and B2 and B3 are towards the uh, periphery, but it doesn't tell us exactly how they actually interact with other types of nuclear structures in cell nucleus. So um, this is uh, uh, the so-called nuclear bodies. So, so in the nucleus there, in, in addition to chromatins, there are all the other uh, structures. For instance, the largest tax is the nucleolus, but there are also other structures, cahal bodies, nuclear speckles, and certainly the uh, uh, nuclear lamina. But there are other other structures, nuclear pores, uh, paranuclear compartments, and, and so on and so forth. And we still don't know too much about um, 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 how the chromatins are interacting with different uh, functional nuclear bodies. And uh, these type of the, 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 we know that these interactions are dynamic, but in the genome-wide manner, how they actually interact, uh, we have surprisingly limited um, information. So we have made some. Uh, um, advances in, in terms of uh, integrative analysis to combine several different uh, genome-wide mapping data to tell us how the chromosomes are spatially organized in the nucleus relative to multiple uh, nuclear bodies. And, and for, for, for this, this is really uh, building upon our uh, uh, collaboration with Andy Bellman and Baspan Stinzo from the first phase of um, our, our uh, a 4D nucleon project. Um, so the one technology is called TSA seq. This is using uh, uh, antibody staining combined with uh, TSA reaction to generate these uh, you know, diffusible biotin labeling near the target 
near, and then so that the degree of bitinylation uh, becomes a function of distance uh, uh, from the target. And uh, through sequencing, you'll be able to generate these kind of genome-wide map. So this showing here, this is the map for TSA for a protein called SON, S-O-N, which is preferentially localized, localized in nuclear speckle. By generating these, these type of uh, uh, tracks, you'll be able to read out the actually the cytological distance. So for instance, in this example, this is about 4 million uh, base pair long uh, genomic uh, trajectory. And uh, by immuno fish, you can see that these probes, they can clearly see that co coming from um, the periphery all the way to um, the um, uh, speckle where this yellow uh, probe is very close to the um, uh, uh, green here is uh, labeling the sun protein. Mm -hmm. And another, um, um, sorry, you may have hear some uh, piano at the background. My daughter is having her uh, virtual piano class right now. I apologize for that. And so another technology we utilize is DEM-ID. So this is uh, pioneered by Baspen Stinzo's lab. And this approach is based on the creation of fusion protein consisting of a, a DEM and a chromatin protein of interest. And um, um, for instance, if you look at the uh, lamina and then uh, you can use lamin, lamin B uh, to, to, uh, as, as the protein of interest. And the DEM methylates A for the GATC sequence. Uh, so it, it, it will leave a unique uh, methylation tag, and then it can be detected by methylation sensitive restriction enzymes. So you can generate these kind of sequencing plots here. If the signal is high, it means that it's closer. It's, it has more, it has higher uh, interaction, higher, um, how to say, um, a contact frequency to your, to your target. So I'll go, and, and these methods can be used to target different nuclear bodies. And right now, as, as long as you have the, pro, you, you know the protein to target. So right now we actually have um, general data for nuclear spacos, nuclear lamina, nuclear olos, these three different nuclear bodies. So our goal is actually, the, the goal is quite, quite straightforward. If you have these different tracks, can we generate a genome-wide segmentation where different colors are um, indicating their different spatial uh, positioning in the nucleus relative to these different uh, nuclear bodies. And we design an approach called SPIN. And, uh, stands for inferring spatial localization patterns. So the input will be the tracks that the type of data showed on the previous slide, TSAC or DEMID. And we also used a uh, high C as part of the in, in input. Mm -hmm. And this these will uh, be fed into a, a, a model actually is a, is a Marco Brandon field um, using a, a graph representation where the nodes are uh, represent I think the uh, nodes are represent genomic loci and the edges are uh, representing uh, whether or not they're adjacent on the genome or whether they, they um, uh, exhibit uh, high, high C interactions. And uh, the, the states are hidden, a priori, and that's something we want to review. And then these hidden states uh, represent uh, the spatial patterns relative to multiple uh, nuclear bodies. Um, so, um, so here's just the formulation, there are hidden states of the nodes and there are node potentials and edge potentials. And um, this is a typical MRF and we use uh, belief propagation to, loopy belief propagation to uh, solve this and then to assign these different states to different genomic loci. And this work is, uh, has been posted on our archive. So just show you some summary of the uh, results. And uh, we end up with 10 different states by applying this approach in K5CS2. This is the uh, cell type that we have uh, most uh, data sets so far, DEMID lamin B, DEMID leucolus, TSA seq lamin, uh, lamin B, and also TSA sun. So you can see that these, these states, they show different uh, distributions in terms of their signals across different, for, for, for these different input data. And these different states certainly represent very distinct and unique spatial localization patterns. And uh, this cartoon basically shows, uh, correspond to the colors, you know, where they are in the nucleus, just give you a sense, um, their relative um, distances and interactions with different nuclear bodies, nuclear speckles, nu nuclear lamina, and also nucleolus. By comparing to the fish result, you can see that these states uh, do show very uh, strong uh, uh, spatial uh, positioning patterns, for instance, lamina and speckle, perhaps not that surprising, surprisingly, but uh, you can also see that even some of the more subtle states, like what we call interior active states, where it's actually in the interior, but it's not that close to nuclear speckle. You can see that clearly that they're not that close to the nuclear uh, speckle. They're a little bit away, but they're also um, not uh, close to the, to the periphery. They're kind of in the middle. 
And um, one main uh, finding is that these uh, states, uh, they stratify the histone marks and also high C uh, sub, uh, subcompartments that I presented earlier. And if you look at these, you know, the rows are different uh, states and then the columns are different uh, histone marks here in, in the slides. And the active marks, certainly they are more enriched in more active, um, uh, more interior um, uh, states, uh, but uh, some of the more repressive marks like S3K9 trimethyl or S3K27 uh, trimethyl there uh, are enriched in more some of the more uh, repressive uh, states like lamina or interior repressive one, interior repressive two. They are, we think that they're perhaps uh, close to nucle nucleolus. And if you look at the correlations to uh, these uh, high C subcompartments, and you can immediately appreciate that we actually um, uh, provide providing some spatial interpretation of these uh, high C subcompartments. For instance, A1, they're mostly uh, spreading out in uh, speckle interactive, and some of them in interactive too. Uh, but the, the like these some of the other repressive uh, uh, state uh, uh, subcompartment like B1, uh, they're more enriched in interior repressive too, but they also show up in some of the other. Uh, state. So this is sort of the more refined separation of spatial compartmentation, but the advantage of that is much more explicit telling us where the chromatins are in the nucleus relative to different functional nuclear bodies. And uh, in terms of function, one important uh, aspect that we looked at is DNA replication timing. Uh, so we use these uh, uh, RepliSeq, uh, multi-fraction RepliSeq generated from uh, David Gilbert's lab. Uh, uh, the columns here, these are different fractions like from uh, in, in S phase uh, from, from early to, to, to late. And uh, we can see that there's a very nice separation of the um, multi-fraction replicacy where the early Christian domains are mostly in interior and active uh, states that we identify. And uh, the late replication domains are in, in um, uh, more towards the uh, nuclear periphery, uh, the lamin like or not lamina, lamina states. And uh, we even compared with uh, replication timing domains and their, their dynamic changes across in, in differentiation. Like and this is an earlier work from uh, Dave Gilbert's lab looking at ESL uh, differentiation. And um, so they did define these uh, replication domains into constitutive early or constitutive late or developmental um, late regulated. Constitutive early means that during that differentiation, that genomic region um, always um, uh, exhibit an early replication. Uh, patterns. And we found that uh, for uh, speckle and uh, uh, interior active and the more towards the interior, then there's much higher fraction of the constitutive early uh, replication domains. Uh, and the um, uh, constitutive late domains are more towards the lamina and lamina-like uh, uh, states, but the developmentally regulated domains are, are spread out, spreading, spread it out in, in, in sort of in, in the middle of the nucleus. And we even look at, you know, one earlier work that uh, in collaboration with uh, David Gilbert's lab, we generated replication timing for uh, hum for um, uh, non-human primates so that you can derive uh, these patterns across different species. And we uh, essentially uh, saw a very similar pattern. So for the um, early, uh, conserved early replicating domains, they're enriched more towards the uh, speckle interior uh, um, states, but for the uh, um, highly conserved late replicating domain, they're uh, enriched in, in nuclear periphery. So how about their comparisons with other nuclear genome features? Like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, uh, loops and uh, topologically associated domains. Um, I didn't uh, put the results on um, uh, comparing to chromatin loops, but we, we did have some observations where um, these loops are, are um, tend to show up in the same uh, states we identify. But here's um, uh, one um, um, screenshot showing an example by comparing to topologically associated domain TADs. So one major observation is that if the chromatin region um, is more towards the nuclear interior, like speckle or speckle um, or in, in interior active regions, these tads are more fragmented. They're more, uh, they're, they're denser and they're smaller, these tads. They're act more active. While if the chromatin is more repressive towards the uh, nuclear periphery, uh, lamina associated domains, and then the tads are larger, um, and they're uh, sparser in terms of the number of TADs in that, in that region. And uh, we also compared with the uh, high C subcompartments I showed you earlier, um, like in here in, at the bottom, this shows the um, high C subcompartment annotations across different uh, cell types. And we saw that um, um, if the um, spin states that we identify are 
in 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 uh, speckle or in uh, lamina, then they are uh, more conserved, right? They correspond to uh, conserved um, um, uh, B3 subcompartment or A1 subcompartment. But if the uh, sphinx states are uh, are in the middle, interior state, interior repressive, interior active, then they are also more dynamic across different cell types by comparing uh, to the subcompartment uh, annotations. So. Um, this is on um, sort of chromosome, chromosome spatial compartmentation, only looking at the chromatin spatial patterns in their interactions and their interactions with other um, uh, nuclear bodies. And um, so in, in, in emergent, um, um, how to say, uh, direction in functional genomics by looking at these regulatory elements is, is to look at these regulatory elements in their nascent um, nuclear um, context in their nuclear um, um, organization context. Um, so there, there's observations, including um, genomic assay uh, approaches and also some live cell imaging approaches to look at these patterns. Um, but in, in terms of the algorithms that how to look at these in a genome-wide manner, uh, perhaps by utilizing uh, vast, you know, a lot of these publicly accessible data sets, um, it, is, it is still relatively lacking. And then we developed this approach, what we call uh, MOCHI, MOCHI, and um, this is published earlier this year on genome research, actually also made a cover. And this was led by two uh, uh, group members, so former postdoc, De Chao, and also graduate student, Luo Chen. So the goal is a, a, a very straightforward. We want to in, integrate chromatin interaction that can be reviewed by hi C, and also the transcriptional regulatory network. So we wanted to identify some spatial patterns that it's a combination of the two. So what we call these modules is what we call heterogeneous interactome modules. It's heterogeneous because in these modules, we're not, we're not only looking at chromatin loci, but we also involve uh, transcription factors. And these are interaction uh, modules. They're sort of a network uh, module. We want to identify these type of genomic loci that come together um, in, this, in space in the meantime, they're regulated by a group of same um, or similar transcription factors. Like in this case, you can see two, what we call two modules or two hymns. One is on the left and the other is on the left or right. And then they, they, they're, they, um, um, they share some of the transcription factors. So the transcription factors can be reused in different uh, modules. So essentially, so we, our goal is to have a to identify a group of uh, these kind of modules where a group of genes are uh, spatially closer to each other than expected, and they're co-regulated by the same set of transcription factors. And we call these trans transcriptional uh, niche. Actually, this term was given by uh, to me by um, uh, generously by uh, Michael Levine at Princeton. So he came to um, Pittsburgh for lunch, and I had lunch with uh, for a visit, and I had lunch with him, and he gave me I present this work to him before we submitted, and he gave me this term. I liked it very much. So we call it transcriptional niche that uh, it sort of describes the kind of um, uh, spatial uh, modules where uh, these chromatins are coming together and they also show functional significance. So the input data for the algorithm, um, they're all public, public uh, available data on like a high C in different cell types. And um, we also incorporate the transcription regulatory network and here we uh, simply used uh, uh, the outcome from an earlier publication, the GRN from this uh, Marbach et al. Nature Methods paper, where the authors used the, um, uh, several, several different approaches, I think CAGE and also um, uh, ChIP-seq data to identify, to, to uh, construct these kind of networks. So in this cartoon, as you can see, if the target gene, the um, uh, consider both the proximal promoter and also distal enhancers, where if the TF binds to distal enhancer, and this, this enhancer is also related to this target gene. And you can also draw these diagrams to show that X is um, regulating A. So overall, you can have these uh, uh, network for in a genome-wide manner. So our input is really a uh, uh, heterogeneous network where we consider both chromatin interaction network and also gene regulatory network. And I have to say that we're not, certainly we're not the first one to um, use um, these notions, right? I'm giving a talk in Michigan, so I have and I think really to acknowledge the, the uh, Indica's work and then some of his 
earlier papers that I think one of the, his uh, review paper on molecular system biology about 10 years ago, it was really illuminating and inspiring for us to develop this work. And, and also more recently, there's some um, um, experimental work that uh, people also observe these um, uh, uh, patterns or, or phenomena, some, uh, some people call it the nuclear condensates and, or enhancer hubs or enhancer cliques and some other um, names. And more recently, I think this week I saw a term called HICS, H-I-C-S, like highly interconnected enhancer, enhancer um, um, domains. Uh, but you know you can call them in, in different names, but we are we call it in a in a in a in a more computational driven computer science oriented um, term like um, interactive modules because I think in terms of biology perhaps there's much more work to 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 do to demonstrate their functional significance. So okay, so a little bit on um, the algorithm itself. So uh, perhaps we all know these um, 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 how to say community detection, right? Um, so there's a lot of work in in the in the um, in the field, and uh, including some of the uh, really pioneering work uh, from from Michigan. So, like in in this in this network, how do you detect these different communities, right? So conventionally, you try to partition the graph, like in the simplest. And if you want to partition the graph into two clusters, you want to minimize the number of times you go across these edges, but maximize the, the number of edges within each community, right? And you can generalize this to multiple um, cluster, multiple communities. And this has been widely used in social network in various application domains. Um, but more recently, you know, this is from Yuri Laskovich's lab at Stanford, this is Benson et al. science paper. What they did is they, uh, instead of looking at these individual um, edges, um, uh, they introduced these uh, motif clustering in, in graphs. So what it shows is that in uh, social network and also in some of the other networks, these uh, triangle motifs seems to have a, a clear advantage in uh, having these um, uh, communities, you know, um, community um, detection in these complex networks. So the idea is the following. You, rather than minimize the number of times you cross a, a single edge, you try to minimize the number of times you disrupt the triangle motifs. So here, like you go across this, um, uh, you partition this graph into two parts. You will have to disrupt the sum of these motif, triangle motifs in the middle. So the goal is to um, uh, minimize this quantity here, um, showing here. So the number of motifs that are being cut or being disrupted in your um, um, groupings, but maximize the number of motifs within each each group. So we look at this um, uh, work and it was really uh, inspired by their um, algorithm. So we made some adaptations and changes to their original algorithm, but the concept is very similar. And here's the adaptation. Rather than using a motif, we actually came up with this um, four node uh, motif where these two nodes are the genes, target genes on the chromatin. And there are also two other nodes represent translation factors. And these are the edges that are involved in the motif. So this described the simple case, sim simplest the case where two genomic loci are spatially close together and they're co-regulated by two different transcription factors. So if you use, if you look at this cartoon in, in panel B here in this um, heterogeneous network where the darker orange, orange ones are the target genes and then uh, lighter ones are transcription factors. You can generate this subgraph adjacency matrix so let me walk you through this. So this is a uh, subgraph adjacency matrix for uh, transcend factor um, one and two. This is quantifies how many times that they are showing up in the same four node motif. So you have one, two, five, six, and also one, two, six, seven. So they're two. two they're showing up in two different four node motifs. And for five, six, they show up only in one. So you can do this for all these different um, um, a subgraph adjacent matrix, and you turn this into a undirected weighted uh, induced graph from your original graph. These edge weights represent essentially how many times they're showing up in the same subgraph. And then you can do a typical, say, let's say, uh, spectral cross train of the original graph. And then, for instance, this original graph can be divided into two modules, HIM is what we call. And we have some heuristics uh, we employed in order to achieve uh, 
um, the fact that uh, we allow overlapping transient factors in, uh, between different uh, modules. So we call our, this algorithm Mochi. And um, so this is essentially the uh, essence of the algorithm itself. So uh, we evaluated this, this, this four node motif and compare by comparing to various um, other motif like three node or, or, or bifurcating, like uh, you have four nodes but missing, but you actually miss some edges. And we show that this uh, motif has advantage uh, in terms of revealing the type of structures we want. Uh, in the meantime, we also show that uh, the, um, uh, these four node motifs can, uh, for the, the modules better reflect functional connections to um, uh, various other aspects by, um, as, as compared to uh, gene regulatory network clusters, right? In the traditional gene regulatory network, you can also identify these clusters where a group of genes are, are, are uh, constantly interacting with each other, for instance. And we show that in terms of DNA replication timing, they show more coordinated uh, replication timing functionally uh, between each other. Uh, within the same uh, HIMSS as compared to GRN clusters. And they have also high enrichment for uh, some of the functional variants like EQTLs and also GWATS hits. I think uh, in E, this is in uh, GM12878 and also K562, these are bot related uh, uh, SNPs that are more enriched in uh, the HIMSS that we uh, identified. And um, these modules uh, also show a very interesting spatial uh, preferences. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, a vast majority of them are located in the active compartment uh, regions in eight compartments. So um, for um, uh, the, the uh, percentage of, of, of HIMS where you know, the number of genes are in eight compartments, you can see that uh, they're uh, mostly in, in eight compartments, uh, the, the vast majority of them. And this is also reflected by comparing to the TSA seq data I showed you earlier. Uh, the uh, x axis here, the sound TSA showing the distance to nuclear sparkles, and then y axis is the uh, lamin B TSA showing the uh, distance to uh, uh, nuclear lamina. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, you know uh, over you know majority of these are closer to uh, nuclear sparkles. However, we also saw that uh, there are uh, these modules that are away from the nuclear interior and are actually close to nuclear periphery. And we look at some of them in detail, like showing on the right-hand side, this is one example where you see that um, um, uh, there are uh, genomic regions like showing here, each, these are the genes, um, uh, um, uh, these are, sorry, the, at, the, at the top, these are the genes, and these are the uh, uh, transferring factors that bind to uh, these target genes. And in this um, HIM, HIM541, you can see that the two, uh, members, two genes are on the left hand side, and another three or four on the right hand side. And there are long range interactions are reflected in, in the high C contact map. And overall, if you look at these um, genomic tracks, they are actually overall, this region is close to nuclear lamina. However, in these gene regions, they are coming off the nuclear lamina. They're um, uh, going towards the nuclear interior as reflected in these in these uh, uh, signals. And if you turn also look at the AB compartment, you see that they show active compartmentalization uh, patterns. So what happens is that if you think about these chromatin trajectory, this overall chromatin is, is, is attaching, like mostly attaching to the nuclear periphery. However, for some of the um, uh, um, genomic loci, they're coming off the nuclear periphery and they show uh, some you know, large scale, long range interaction between them and some of them may be mediated by um, these function these these transferring factors that I, that are uh, listed here even though the exact function um, has yet to be uh, disclosed um, so and then, and then we ask you know for the genes that are uh, say they're always in these different um, in in these in these modules and versus the ones that only show up in some of the cell types and we found that if the genes are always in uh, these modules across uh, six different cell types here, uh, or, or five different cell types here, um, they have some very unique functions. They show is there are essential genes, or they're uh, how, more more likely to be housekeeping genes. Um, although we also observe that there are genes that do show cell type specificity. Uh, for instance, here list here in this plot, all these genes are. Uh, close to nucleoli in GM12878. But if you look at their distance, 
um, to uh, nucleus buckle and nucleolamina in K562, you saw that uh, some of them actually are pretty close to uh, a, nu a, a nucleus buckle, in particular this module 276, right? So it's a 2267, it's actually very, very close to nucleus buckle. So uh, what might happen is that this module um, and uh, the, the genes in this module change their position between these two different cell types. They are closer to nucleoli in uh, GM1278, but uh, they switched position in, in nuclear localization in uh, K562, um, you know, closer to nucleus buckle in K562. So to summarize this part, uh, we think that this approach may be uh, an interesting, um, some kind of pattern mining um, framework that can allow us to uh, integrate functional and structural features. And um, so we're not only looking at enhancers or genes, but uh, in, or we're not only looking at loops and tads, but something perhaps in between where you can integrate um, uh, the observations from both and then identify some interesting spatial patterns, especially if they are uh, dynamic or they're conserved across different uh, cellular conditions. But of course, you know, what are the formation mechanisms for uh, these structures, right? For these structures and are there cis or trans factors that are mediating these these, these interesting patterns and um, the short answer is that we don't know. And uh, this is actually one, will be one of the uh, main focus that uh, in, in our next phase in the 4D nuclear consortium. And earlier next, uh, 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 earlier last year, I wrote a preview article when uh, David Gilbert's lab uh, published their, their uh, early working replicating uh, control element, a, a type of cis element that control replicating timing and also 3D genome organization. And so I lay out, uh, we lay out with uh, my colleague Ji Jun Duan at University of Washington, we laid out some of these uh, perspectives in, in, this, in, this, um, in this article and essay. And if you're interested, take a look. So the, 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 the idea is that we think that there are uh, many factors that may be involved in uh, regulating, modulating uh, both the uh, uh, genome function and also 3D genome organization that are intrinsically uh, intertwined. So in the next, um, uh, you know, last uh, couple minutes, um, I just want to mention this um, uh, very recent work from uh, graduate student Roche. Um, this this was published in Cell Systems and also uh, showed up earlier in, in Recom. So I, at the beginning, I mentioned there, in addition to um, high C, there are emergent technologies that can measure um, multi-way chromatin interactions at single nucleus resolutions. But the analysis tool is actually quite uh, limited so far. And uh, we uh, designed a machine learning algorithm to improve the uh, first the, the quality and also can facilitate a lot of subsequent analysis uh, from these, uh, say, chair pattern, chair, uh, uh, chair, chair drop in and sprite uh, data. So these data are quite um, noisy and, um, and there could be missing um, information in it. So the idea is whether we can train a model to denoise the original data. By denoising, meaning that we want to improve, uh, reduce the false positives and false negatives. And we can even do predictions. If I give you uh, three, four, or five genomic loci, you predict whether or not they're going to form a multi-way chromatin interaction. So I often use the analogy in social, social networks and on uh, Facebook, where you have these group chat, right? You can, or, 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 and uh, you know, you use uh, WeChat or or um, other um, uh, messaging tools. You can form these uh, group chat. So the task is like I give you a few individuals their their information. Can you predict their whether they're going to form a we a, a, a group chat right in, in in these apps? So here that rather than group chat, we are uh, predicting whether they're forming these multi-way chromatin interactions. Like, like, like I'm showing you here. So with this, you know, of course, we can predict these multi-way interactions and we can denoise the, um, the byproduct as we can denoise the uh, original data. And we, um, as a, a representation, representation learning, you can also uh, generate uh, embedding vectors for uh, the 1D genomic um, loci. And these embedding vectors could be used for various other tasks, right? Say, you know, simple as clustering, or you can use it for other predictive uh, tasks, for example. So in the interest of time, I probably will skip this slide of Jules, just show you some um, uh, results, but just to mention that a, a key uh, structure here we use is a, a, a type of hypergraph representation learning 
uh, architecture we uh, published last, uh, actually also this year in a machine learning conference for, uh, called ICR, iClear. And so uh, the idea is that uh, very briefly, so you can decompose these, uh, um, um, the high C like contact matrix, right? Give you these vectors for each genomic bin and for several of them. And you predict whether or not they're gonna form a, a multi-way contact like I, like I show here, a, a cluster. Of course, the, the, um, the tricky part is how you actually um, generate uh, the negative samples. And the positive samples are straightforward because they are observed in experiments, um, or at least as some of the ones that are more reliably ex observed in experiments, but negative samples could be uh, tricky, but we devised some, some approaches that we think uh, uh, mitigate, uh, that mitigates uh, uh, some potential biases and, and, and problems. So if you're ever interested, you can uh, look at both of these, the Iclea paper, Sarah Sagan, and also the Cell Systems paper. So here's just um, some, some, some results to show you that the method actually uh, works quite well. This is the original spry. You can see that if it's off diagonal, the pattern some kind, it, it, it um, seems to be obscured by, um, seems to be obscured. So it'd be great if we can clean this up. You can reduce the false positive and the false negative. And um, so this is the result after we denoise de using, uh, we call our method matcha. So SPRI is developed by Mitch Gutman's lab in uh, Caltech. And you can see that after you denoise the uh, Sprite uh, original data, if you compare with the, uh, and you aggregate them, if you compare with the population high C, you can see the patterns are clearer and you can see much uh, more similarities between Sprite and, and high C. And we use some more quantitative approach that use, using this uh, Stratton adjusted correlation coefficient um, SCC that uh, to quantify uh, the similarities, you can see that um, um, uh, Marcha uh, denoised uh, contact matrix shows uh, much higher uh, agreement uh, SCC score with the population high C uh, for different um, uh, types of interactions in terms of their um, uh, pairwise distances. And uh, we can even also use this for de novo predictions. Um, here's one example. Um, you know, de novo prediction is 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 a little tricky to um, prove, right? Because uh, you have to use some other data as as um, to 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 support. And um, in this, what I show you here is in this region. So you are seeing three different regions. You know, left, middle, and also on the right hand side. And um, these are the original sprite. Um, data, like each row is a, how to say, is a uh, cluster that Sprite data identify. So all of them are the triplets here. Um, you can see that uh, the triplets kind of cover, only cover only uh, two of them, or either the middle or the left or the middle and the right, but never three of them at the same time. And we think that this one may be missed by the original Sprite, but captured by the machine learning approach in, uh, in Matcha. And um, actually we used a single cell high C in the same data set in GM12878. And you can see that the, there are signals that these three loci are forming these uh, multi-way contacts in the same nucleus. And so we used some other uh, tracks like uh, there's a super enhancer here and there, um, the, these TFs also bind to uh, these regions and their uh, key transient factors may be mediating this, this complex. So this shows you the um, potential um, of this approach to at least to predict um, some of the potential uh, complex, um, these multi-way um, chromatin interaction complexes that may be missed by experimental approaches like Sprite. And finally, these embedding vectors that I mentioned can be used for other analysis. You can see that our embedding generated by my chart is highly correlated with uh, some genome functions like DNA replication timing, and also they show distinct um, groupings as compared to high C subcompartment um, annotations in the same cell type. So just to um, uh, summarize, so you may ask uh, what's next. So this is Jun mentioned that uh, we recently received a um, um, UN1 center grant for the next five years in uh, NIH for the Nucleum uh, Consortium uh, program. And so I serve the contact PI, but this is really a teamwork with uh, many other uh, investigators. We have uh, Frank Albert from UCLA, Ting Wu from Harvard Medical School, uh, Andy Bellman at uh, University of Illinois, and um, David Gilbert at uh, Florida State, and uh, Susan Rafalski at uh, Allen Institute for Cell Sciences, uh, Jason Swetlow at the University of Dundee in the UK, uh, uh, Nicola Noretti at the, uh, Brown, 
and also Tom Mistelli uh, as our um, intramural collaborator from NCI. So we formed this team, as you can see, that we all come from very different background. So our goal is to really uh, to try to solve a so-called grand challenge to uh, really map out the nuclear organization, not only the chromatin interactions, in, uh, but also their uh, very uh, dynamic interactions with very complex uh, functional nuclear bodies. And I only showed you some of the nuclear bodies, the nucleolus, nucleospecal, nuclear lamina. But as I showed you in the, in the cartoon, in, in the review uh, by David Spector, there are many other functional uh, nuclear bodies, and some of which probably we don't even know, uh, but we hope that we'll be able to uh, have some uh, insight um, how uh, they function in a nuclear body, in, in, in the nucleus, and also their functional impact on chromatin organization and also genome function. And we're going to involve, uh, generate uh, not only the genomic data, but various types of imaging data, including live cell imaging and also genome um, uh, imaging like um, oligopain, oligostome. This is mostly from uh, Ting Wu's lab. And my group will uh, lead some effort in machine learning methods for uh, integrating these various types of data. And by working with Frank Albert, we're going to generate some realistic 3D structure models uh, to look at uh, not only the structure itself, but also the variability um, of, of these structures. And ultimately, we, uh, these data will be uh, visualized in, in an integrated visualization platform. And we want to capture various types of biological processes, developmental process, cell cycle, environmental perturbations, and our predict predictions can be uh, validated using uh, genome engineering. So our, our, our goal is like, you know, there's a lot of science uh, uh, areas in, in science, the whole is really uh, greater than the sum of uh, its part that applies to our understanding of the nuclear organization, right? Not only the chromatin pairwise interactions, but many other complex uh, phenomena, but it also applies to, I think, uh, uh, different labs. You know, we're, this is a team science that we hope that uh, uh, collectively we're gonna produce something um, uh, quite, quite unique and, and interesting uh, to the field. And uh, so I, uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the end, I would like to encourage you to uh, visit our uh, visualization tool that we're still developing. Uh, this is really a uh, um, um, effort by uh, Xiaopeng Zhu in my group and in collaboration with Jason Swedel's lab who developed uh, Omero uh, system. Uh, it's a large scale visualization for microscopy images. Our goal is to integrate genomic data, uh, imaging data, and also structure model. So it gives you like some kind of uh, Google Earth um, uh, experience where uh, you, you, this, this is a platform where you can navigate uh, the nucleus and, and also looking at uh, various types of data sets, including um, imaging modalities and genomic measurements and also the computational predictions and modeling results. And I think, uh, you know, GLU's lab uh, at uh, Michigan has, has been uh, having really, uh, uh, enjoying uh, using this approach, uh, using this tool for their own research. And um, so this is all now great, but we'll continue to develop this tool uh, in the next phase of 40 year. So with that, I would like to um, um, uh, acknowledge the first the, the funding sources from NIH, mostly from uh, new, for the nucleum for the work that I presented today. Um, and so I already mentioned uh, uh, many uh, post uh, trainees in my group uh, when I mentioned their work but certainly other uh, group members in my, in my lab also contributed. And uh, this would work, uh, these work uh, would not be possible without collaborations with um, our collaborators within um, the first phase of 40N. And uh, we also look forward to working closely with our um, other labs in our uh, UM1 Senegran in the next phase. And uh, we constantly receive uh, input and suggestion from many other labs in the, in the larger uh, for the nucleum uh, network. And uh, with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Yeah, even though the time is late, I'd be very happy to moderate some questions. Yeah. Uh, who wants to ask first? You know, Jen, that was great. Thanks, this is Brian. Good to see you and congratulations on your new center grant. It's really phenomenal. And that- Thank you, hi, Brian. Good too, it's good to see you. Uh, you know, I just, you know, it looks like the speckles could be a trans transcription factor, con transcriptional condensate, condensates, you know, I mean, you know, I would think with your tools, you'd be able to see if uh, 
you know, several successive uh, topologically associated domains are contributing to the, you know, uh, structure of those speckles, and that maybe what you got is a super enhancer um, phase transition happening there. I mean, is that the way you think it's going? Yeah, no, I think, I think, yes, yes, exactly. So I think this, it needs some, some new analysis approaches by, uh, uh, you know, integrating these different features and including, you know, tads and loops and also their spatial positioning and uh, to, to identify these patterns. And as I mentioned, we're particularly interested in the, um, say, formation mechanisms, why these things are happening. And, um, and uh, what are the important factors? If you want to perturb, let's say you want to do an experiment, you want to perturb something, what kind of factors or sequence elements you want to perturb um, to show that they are important for the maintenance and stability of these, of these structures. But, but you're absolutely right. You know, we're looking into some of these uh, 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 structures and I think they're all kind of intertwined and they're all connected, right? The spatial context is important for uh, loops and tads. Yeah, the, yeah, you know, the big challenge, uh, thank you. The big challenge, you know, is the timing, you know, in terms of these things kind of come and go, you know. You look Correct. Stuff that, Correct. And so it's just, uh, so one of the things I think is still, you know, uh, a challenge is, uh, and by the way, those cleaned up uh, chromatin, you know, those clean, denoised, um, uh, you know, uh, images that you showed are really quite remarkable, but they still, are, can, are made up by a collection of different cells that might have different chromosome states that aren't, you know, even synchronized with one another. Yeah, so, yeah, no, you know, I think yeah, that's, that's an important that's a big yeah, problem. That's an important point. And then uh, we are also exploring uh, some of those directions to deconvolve that. For instance, we, I, I, I didn't present, but we have some ongoing work um, in looking at, you know, single cell high C and some of the other single cell uh, uh, assays. Um, in, in that direction to look at, let's say, in a cell population that may undergo a uh, quite dynamic uh, processes and to see how they actually change. And, um, and certainly some of these insights can be, can be, can be uh, used to, you know, can generate candidates for live cell um, experiments. Yeah, no, it's really exciting. Congratulations again. We're going to be, can't wait for you to come visit, you know, and, uh, I see that one dinner shot that you showed was prior to COVID, you know? <laughs> oh, man. Jay, it looks like you have a question. Oh, I, I, we have a question from the audience. OK. Yeah, uh, uh, Jan, can you read it, or should I read it for you? Um, uh, in yeah, the chat. Can, OK, let me see if I can. Uh, I don't see it. OK. Thanks, Jia. I got to go, but I, I hope we can. Yeah hook up soon thanks a lot okay sure great to see you again yeah, great to see you and you know david gilbert's a good friend of mine you got a smart guy there it's great okay to all right okay yeah. bye bye Sorry. oh so the question is uh i have two questions first is to him in kfax 2 data t of binding site in a nuclear peripheries from hemobox uh um hemobox uh tfs that's not expressed in kfax 2 what's your idea on that Second one is how do you related TADs and nuclear locations? Can the dense and sparse TADs you show just because gene density? Oh no, those are both are great, great questions. First one, um, I don't know. I, we have to, we have to, we have to check what what's the you know we just use the um, um, regular network from the earlier publications. But um, you're right, you know, for perhaps we should do a more careful work to um, further filter. Uh, to to look at more active TFs, um, but I think that's that's an um, uh, interesting question. Although it, uh, I think our approach will will still work um, in 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 that kind of context. The second question is uh, important. I I don't have a clear answer. Uh, we are also looking into some of that. I think gene density or or the um, how to say the chromatin itself. They're more active. Is certainly one factor. You see that. This is, has, has also been observed in um, other, you know, TAD oriented works that people look at these TADs and hierarchical TADs and sub -tads and, you know, certainly in more active regions that you see more hierarchies of, of, of TADs. So that's, that's one 
I guess it's not really an explanation, but it's it's a confirmation that these observations can be also be observed in in, in other types of analysis. But why that's happening, or I think it's it's I don't have a clear answer. Uh, may I ask another question quickly? Sure, sure. Uh, so I feel uh, a lot of this 3C or high C method is limited to pairwise comparison is due to the short rate sequencing. So with a lot of the new like nanopore long rates and new technology allow you to uh, like interpolate this, uh, interpret this high order comparison. Do you have any comments on that? Um, I saw some recent work that people are using uh, um, nanopore and also pack bio, right? To mm -hmm. read out, let's say, multi-way. There's a method called, um, I forgot the name. There's sort of like, a, it's like a, some kind of walk that you can, right. you can, you can probe multiple uh, loci at the same time because the read length is longer. And that certainly can perhaps potentially um, go beyond pairwise. Um, but yes, I think, you know, I, I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think there are data sets like this that, um, that I think long reads will, will, be, will be helpful, particularly for these multi-way multi -way contacts. And York Decker's lab, I think, also has a, a recent paper uh, specifically look, using the back, back bio reads to uh, look at, uh, let's say, these different chromosomes, whether they entangled uh, these interactions or not, right? You can, if the reader long enough, you will be able to read out right. uh, more, you know, beyond pairwise interactions. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. I think it's really important to have Oxford-like long read to validate your suspected multi-way interaction. Because near, near the end, you talked about how you, seems to see multi-way interaction in the same nucleus. I think that's really a big deal because with prior bulk data, you can always suspect it's uh, right. cells not synchronized for cell cycle. That's right, that's right, that's yeah. right. That's right. You know, what? the other direction is that when the single cell high C, you know, the coverage is high, um, higher, I think uh, um, maybe we can cap, um, pick up a lot of those uh, more complex interactions too. Any other questions? Uh, hi, this is Tom Krapola. Uh, may I ask a question about the difference between time variability as in dynamics and in cell-to-cell -cell variability as in population variations? You mentioned a little bit of single cell analysis data and your ambition is apparently to connect with the imaging data do you think that there are ways in which the sequencing data can provide distinctions between time and population variability? Um, yeah, so, you know, I think single cell, single cell high C, I mean, the uh, GLU has already done some work in uh, uh, looking at single cell high C by developing new approaches to uh, represent uh, each cell. And then, you know, for cells that are undergoing uh, uh, cell cycle, you can already see that they're, uh, 3D genome organization are different that uh, because they are in different different uh, S phase, for instance, and then you, you can see that they're they're globally they are different, and uh, but there I think there are still challenges. For instance, the, the resolutions are relatively low at the moment, so um, perhaps at the moment most of the analysis that can be reliably reliably done are um, you embedded the entire cell and then you 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 look at their 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 global grouping and patterns. But if you want to narrow down to individual um, features like tads and loops, and um, you know, it, it, I think it, it will becoming, it will be becoming possible, but right now there, there are still challenges. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think there are, there are data sets and technologies that can, can be, can be used to, to answer those questions, right? I, you know, both for, to look at the differences in the, in the cell population, but also, if a if a cell population is undergo um, uh, some some biological processes or 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 it as a response to um, external perturbations. Other questions? 
Well, that concludes our seminar, Jen. Thank you so much. Really. All right. Thanks very much. Thank yeah, you for all your, for your to, attention. To, yeah, to come in April. So that was great. But we're glad to have you now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Have a all good right. evening. Thank you very much.